Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, thank you, Meredith, for that um, very um, theoretical academic paper. So I'm going to try and bring it to reality on the ground and to the Malaysian context and try to apply um, some of the theory and analysis to what's going on um, in Malaysia. And I, and I think I want to focus um, on, I think, the contestations within the Malaysian public sphere between um, progressive, liberal, civil society organizations and um, what words shall I use to describe them? You know, illiberal, <laughs> um, illiberal, um, intra-ethnic, intra-religious, civil society, uncivil society um, groups. Um, and I think the exciting contestation, so I, I would, um, you know, differentiate a little bit from Meredith's pessimistic conclusion. I think what's happening in Malaysia is actually very exciting. Um, it's a challenge that we need to face, um, you know, front on, full frontal, you know, grapple with a big elephant in the room. Um, and I think it's great that we have this vibrant space now in Malaysia, in particular with the rise of um, the internet, the internet media, the social media. I don't think we would have this vibrant public debate without the internet. Yeah, without um, information technology, without social media. So I think it's really you know, an exciting opportunity for us to engage, to shape the future of this country, to shape the debate and to shape the discourse by coming, um, you know, to, you know, coming out with new ideas um, you know, and, and this very public contestation. It's very, for me, it's extremely important that this contestation take place openly in the public space. You know, as you can see, you know, like the examples that Meredith presented, you know, um, all these um, racist um, 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 Islamist NGOs in Indonesia, you know, it's not that they did not exist. You know, you had a strong government that just suppressed them. And the minute that strong government gets overthrown, the, the, the authoritarian government gets over, overthrown, they emerge. You see this in Yugoslavia. Um, as well, you know, so it's not that, uh, you know, they, they exist within society, so I think for me it's better that these um, contestations take place publicly, you know, to shape the future of the country and which direction a country wants to go. And certainly I think in Malaysia it's so obvious, you know, we have an incredibly vibrant, vibrant groups, the human rights groups, uh, women's rights groups, environmental groups, um, you know, groups like Linus, um, you know, I guess that would be part of, of the environment movement, you know, building of, um, you know, waste nuclear plants, waste disposal plants, and the effect on the environment and health. Um, neighborhood associations, you know, also in the past several years, neighborhood associations have really become a strong voice of organizing at the community level, um, like my neighborhood, you know, against construction of you know, office blocks and yet more shopping complexes and yet more condominiums in what was supposed to be green lungs um, in the city. So, so all these are extremely important growth and development, I think, um, you know, within the Malaysian civil society um, sphere. And, and what we're seeing as well in particular, and, and, and these are the liberalizing NGOs, the one that I feel contribute to the democratization, to the empowerment, um, and to public participation um, you know, in building the democracy. But I think what is disturbing and what we really need to deal with is the rise of you know, the intra-ethnic illiberal groups based on race and religion. And I think we all know the rise of uh, Picasso, the rise of Isma. Um, and this is not something new, yeah? It's been going on for the past 10 years. It's just that their voice have become um, you know, extremely belligerent and loud. Um, and we can discuss like why, why has this been so? Why have they had enjoyed that space um, to present as if they represent you know, the whole Malay Muslim community um, of Malaysia. Um, and, and I think, you know, and, and, and what does this mean in terms of the democratization, liberalization process that we are going through, that those of us in the, um, you know, uh, in the progressive civil society movement, um, the challenge that that poses in us trying to move the country towards increased democratization. 
um, you know, in particular because these voices seem to have the illiberal voices, seem to have the support of the government of the ruling party, and to have the support of some key mainstream media. Yeah, and I want at this stage, I really want to bring to you to bring to your attention. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the work of Ashutosh Vashni. Um, I think his work is extremely important um, for Malaysia. And in fact, the second book, I don't know whether it has come out, uh, it included a study on Malaysia uh, on the Kampo Medan conflict. But I just want to draw your attention to his analysis of ethnic conflict and civil life. Um, he's a political scientist teaching at Michigan University, and he really, what I felt, and I felt he really offered a very compelling thesis that the greater the patterns of inter, yeah, inter-communal civic engagement in a city, the lower the likelihood of violent conflict and riots. And he spent 10 years of intensive research where he examined three pairs of Indian cities, one that is riot prone and one that is not. And he concluded that pre-existing local networks of civic engagement between Hindus and Muslims stand out as the single most important explanation for the difference between peace and violence. And his work really leaves a lot for us to think about in terms of what's going on in Malaysia today and the dangers. You know, we are rightfully, we have the right to feel that you know, that this slippery slope, slope that we're on can lead to violence and conflict if we don't stop it right now. Um, so he says that trust built on inter-ethnic, social and civic ties, not intra-ethnic networks, is critical for peace. So he found the presence, um, and in particular here he's looking, he's comparing Calicut and Aliga, yeah? He found the presence of inter-ethnic associations decisive in preventing violence because inter-ethnic associations, and you know, apply this Malay, Chinese, Indian, Sabah, Sarawak, yeah, build bridges. Um, Meredith mentioned that. And manage tensions in times of ethnic conflict and differences. You know, and, and he found that you know, everyday engagement between ethnic groups, sometimes we're, we're comfortable with the idea, oh, we're socializing together, we're eating together, we kong si raya, we celebrate our, our, our Christmas and Hari Raya together, our children are playing together. That is not enough, he says. Yeah? Um, it, 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 that works at the village level, he says. That kind of everyday, you know, soft social engagement is strong enough at the village level um, you know, to, to, to bring people together and to prevent violence. But in the city, that kind of social inter-ethnic um, ties are not enough, not resilient, you know, as the more formal, organized, inter-ethnic associations. You know, especially when confronted, and I think his work on looking at why there's violence and why there's no violence, the role of politicians especially when confronted with attempts by politicians to polarize citizens along ethnic lines in urban settings. So without that formal inter-ethnic associations, when politicians, as a political strategy, um, um, you know, uh, promote or create ethnic conflict and ethnic suspicion, you know, with, without those strong formal inter-ethnic associations and ties, the society, the fabric of society is not strong enough to resist the potential for violence. And I really believe that there, you know, there are really um, important lessons in his work yeah, for us in Malaysia as we really we confront a seemingly escalating ethno-religious contestations over rights, identity, culture, religion, resources, um, you know, who gets what contract and who's not getting what contract. Yeah? Vashni underlines the difference between ethnic conflict and ethnic violence. Conflict, he says, is inevitable in an ethnically plural society like Malaysia, where different ethnic groups are free to organize, to assert competing demands from the state. The rub is how to prevent ethnic conflict from turning into ethnic violence. And Vashni's works provides compelling arguments for the type of civil society that better serves good governance and peace in a country like Malaysia.
In political theory, organizations which bring people together in the public sphere between the family and the state are said to serve a kind of social capital. It contributes to the development of a public culture of citizenship and inclusive participation. Therefore, there is always the assumption that civil society is good for democracy, as Meredith said. But yet, we also know that there are you know, illiberal, uncivil civil society, the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, the Hindu or Muslim militant groups in India are anything but civil in their behavior. As um, you know, the, the American anthropologist, um, Robert Hefner, who works on Indonesia, he said that you know, the Christian and Muslim extremist groups active in religious violence in Indonesia um, you know, in 1999 to 2001 were civil society groups but they were also capable of promoting racism, chauvinism, and violence. And you see that in Malaysia today with the, what Picasso and Isma in particular are doing and saying um, in you know, um, it, all these inciting words, inflammatory words and statements and supported by the state or the state is complicit in its silence yeah, um, to this, the kind of um, inflammatory statements made by groups like Picasso and Isma. Thus, the social capital built by such intra-ethnic, single ethnic, yeah, like Picasso, like Isma, Civic Association, only builds trust and peace within their own single ethnic or religious group. As Vashni's research shows, such communal and ethnic-based organizations are not only often incapable of preventing Hindu-Muslim riots in these cities he studied, but are also associated with the escalation. So they escalate communal violence, yeah? these civil society groups, intra-ethnic civil society groups. What matters for ethnic violence is not whether ethnic life or social capital exists, but whether social and civic ties cut across ethnic groups. That's what matters the most, his 10 years of research shows in India. He makes two other findings that are also significant for Malaysia. First, the role of politicians. He says he finds that politicians who seek to polarize Hindus and Muslims for the sake of electoral advantage can tear at the fabric of everyday engagement through the organized might of criminals and gangs. So politicians very often are in cahoots with criminals and gangs. And if you look at Pakida and what Pakida does um, and who's working in alignment with Pakida, you know, just, you see all these parallels, you know, this, this theory operates in India, it can also operate and analyze you know, and help us to understand the situation in Malaysia. That politicians alone are not enough. They operate with criminals and with gangs. And without, he says that without the involvement of organized gangs, large scale rioting and killings are unlikely to happen. So you have to work with gangs, yeah, to, to, to create the violence that you want. And without, not only that, and without the protection afforded by politicians, such criminals would have been prosecuted under the law. So the violence occurs because the politicians work with the criminals and with the gangs and with the thugs, and the politicians provide protection. So, so the police then are not empowered to take action, cannot take action because of political interference. Yeah? So then this situation escalates into violence. In peaceful cities, his study shows, where trade unions, business associations, teachers, lawyers, doctors, NGOs, and cadre-based political parties are communally integrated. Yeah, so political parties that work across ethnic lines or are, you know, multiracial political parties. Vashni finds a synergy emerges between civic organizations and local arms of government. He says this leads to better monitoring and preventive action as these relationships nip 
rumors, small caches, tensions in the bud. In the end, polarizing politicians who try to operate in these cities either do not succeed or eventually give up trying to provoke and engineer communal violence. The other thing that I think is also extremely relevant for us in terms of you know, what he found in his study is the role of the press. In, in the violent cities that he studied, the press, instead of investigating rumors, and these rumors are often strategically planted and spread by these polarizing politicians, the press simply print them with abandon. You see that in Utusan. Chinese, you know, about to take the, over the country. The Christians want a Christian prime minister. Front page headlines, deliberately provocative, you know, headlines planted by these illiberal groups or politicians, yeah? What was also not a surprising finding was the journalistic connections. Muslim thugs with Urdu press, Hindu thugs with Hindi press. And studying peaceful Calicut and violent Aliga over the Babri Mosque um, riots, he found Aliga's local newspapers printing inflammatory falsehoods. Just print, whatever they get, they print. Yeah? While Calicut, in Calicut, the newspapers neutralize rumors after investigating and finding them unfounded. So you have a responsible press, responsible editors, you hear these rumors that are you know, inflammatory, could be um, you know, uh, uh, you know, like scaremongering, fearmongering, they check. They check the rumors to see whether it is true, there's basis or not. And then they don't publish it because these are just rumors, yeah? So he does not, however, believe um, that the press, you know, so the issue that should the press, you know, be controlled and not um, covered. He doesn't believe that the press should restrain itself from reporting truthfully. It's important that the press, you know, if there's really violence or tension, the press should be reporting the ground realities, but of course should be responsible, um, you know, um, um, in his reporting and checking the facts. So I just wanted to bring to your attention that work and, and to really, you know, how, how do we use that, that analysis and that study in India and what warning signs and warning bells that that um, indicate to us in terms of the situation in Malaysia and, and where we're at, you know? So, you know, I think, I think the fear that many people feel um, today um, in Malaysia, you know, yes, you know, Pakasa, Isma have the right, you know, to say, to fight for their cause. They believe in Malay supremacy, Islamic supremacy, supremacy of Islamic law. They should have that public space um, um, to, to, to say that. But the issue is, you know, should the media, you know, when they make allegations that are so far-fetched, should the media just with abandon publish that on the front page, you know, headlines without having another opinion to challenge that opinion? So, you know, I always, you know, tell some friends, you know, in Utusan and all that, yeah, okay, you want to publish those opinions, fine. But where's the alternative opinion? Where are the voices that don't agree? Where's the analysis? There's no analysis. There's no counter voices when there are counter voices in the public space, but your newspaper does not reflect the diversity of viewpoints on this particular issue. You know, you present it as if this is how the whole Malay community or the Muslim community feel when you know there are contested voices, um, you know, within, um, within the, the community. And, um, and really, like, you know, in the end, I think um, for us in civil society, um, you know, it, it is, you know, I mean, I see a lot of um, um, positive developments, really, in terms, in, in particular, how the importance of social media, the importance of the online alternative press in giving voices, in reflecting that diversity of voices. It is a cacophony, of course. It leads to a cacophony. It leads to a lot of confusion, you know, who speaks, who, who, whose voice, you know, but I think it's good that we are all exposed to diverse voices and, um, you know, and, 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 and really 
um, build a culture of an informed and rational debate and discussion on these issues, and in the end, ask ourselves, what kind of Malaysia do we want? What kind of, you know, where, where are we heading here? A Malaysia where, you know, one group, one religion, you know, exercises its supremacy on the basis of race and religion alone, you know, or a society, a truly multi-ethnic plural society that celebrates that, embrace and celebrate that diversity as a source of wealth and strength, you know, where prosperity is shared um, by all on the basis of citizenship and rights are on the basis of citizenship as well. So I'll just leave you at that. Thank you.